The NBA regular season is over and the NBA playoffs and play in tournament are about to begin. These are going to be my NBA playoff predictions, specifically focusing on the first round of the NBA playoffs. If you guys are new to Utility Sports, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content like what you see in this video. And we're gonna break down each first round series and really what I expect from each matchup. There's a, a bevy of great games, a bevy of great series, and I'm very, very excited to discuss them in depth. We're gonna have a lot of other great content coming out on the channel as well, focusing on teams that are already eliminated with some off-season previews. We're gonna have uh, some NBA draft content coming out as well. So no matter what fan uh, you happen to be a team of, make sure to go check out some of those videos. And let's jump into our video preview here. The overall playoff picture is where we're going to start. We're going to take a quick peek at where things shake out, the schedule for the play-in games as well, plus my predictions for those. Of course, now very possible some of you are watching after the play-in games have already happened. And have I been wrong before? Yes. Is it possible I'm wrong again? Absolutely it is. So especially in a one-game play-in situation, if I get it wrong, I'm sorry. I'm going to try my best to get those games right, obviously. Uh, but it really is not going to impact the first round series a ton. It does a little bit, of course. Um, I do think there's going to be competitive series through and through this year, especially in that Western Conference. But uh, just, you know, bear with me a little bit if I get a playing game wrong. Okay, I'm trying my best here. Eastern Conference first round series matchups and breakdowns. Last year, uh, I pretty much nailed both the East and West through the first two rounds of the playoffs. And uh, I feel pretty confident this year as well. A little bit less confident in the West than I do the East, but still somewhat confident in my expectations. So we're going to talk about the first round series between both of those, break down some of the matchups I like. This is a very basketball centered video in terms of the actual play um, and not just talking about, oh, well, player X, player Y. <clears throat> we're going to talk about certain things that I like for each team. And then my overall thoughts, my favorites heading into this postseason, and then also uh, just my generic thoughts on on what I think is going to happen, things to watch for, X factors, maybe players who have a lot to prove or not. We'll talk about quite a few of those things throughout this video. So I hope you guys do enjoy. Again, smash that like button if you do. And let's jump into the actual playoff bracket. As of right now, you see the playing teams, New Orleans, Oklahoma City, the Lakers, Minnesota. That's your seven and eight there in the Western Conference. Of course, New Orleans is your nine. Oklahoma City is your 10. And then in the east side, we have Chicago and Toronto as your 9-10. Miami's the 7, Atlanta's the 8. Then you look at the one seeds, Denver and Milwaukee, respectively, for the west and east. And then the four fives, both great series, Phoenix and L.A. Uh, talking about the Clippers, the better team in L.A. Sorry, Lakers fans, don't mean to trigger you. Uh, then four five, we have the Clippers, Knicks on the east side. Then Sacramento, Golden State, which I think is a very fascinating series <clears throat> to talk about. Then the 3-6, Philadelphia, Brooklyn. I know some people are going to be picking Brooklyn. I think that's an interesting series to talk about a little bit as well. I'm very excited to watch that series uh, this year. And then Memphis will be playing the seventh seed, and Boston is the two seed in the East. So overall, a lot of really good teams this year in the playoffs, the teams that are very, very talented, a lot of stars in this postseason, but there's also a lot of other good role players. So I'm very excited to talk about it. Let's focus on the playing tournament quick. The seven and eights, they have a huge advantage because first of all, they get two shots to win one game and then make the playoffs that way. Plus, they also get an extra day of rest. Seven and eights play each other on Tuesday, April 11th. The nine tens play each other on Wednesday, April 12th. And because of that, the seven and eight seed, whichever team loses there, would then be trying to fight for the eight seed spot. We'll actually have a day to watch the games of the team that they're about to play next and give themselves a little bit of extra prep time and one more day of rest as well. So definitely a big advantage being in these seven and eight spots for the play-in tournament. And let's look at the eight versus seven. Lakers hosting the Minnesota Timberwolves. We have an old Minneapolis showdown here a little bit where the Lakers, of course, formerly from Minneapolis, but if we're talking about former Minneapolis players as well, uh, let's look at Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, uh, and D'Angelo Russell as guys who would be motivated to beat the Minnesota Timberwolves. We know specifically Malik Beasley and Jared Vanderbilt very motivated to play well against Minnesota. Tim Connolly, the GM for the Timberwolves uh, and actually president of basketball operations, has traded those two guys twice, uh, once out of Denver and then out of Minnesota pretty much the moment he arrived there. And Minnesota's kind of in the center of some turmoil right now inside the organization uh, with, of course, Rudy Gobert infamously punching Kyle Anderson during the game, during a timeout after... 
Uh, Kyle Anderson had some choice words for him. Now, I'm not going to get into that incident too much. I don't think Kyle Anderson was in the right by any means. Now, do I think Gobert should have punched him? Definitely not. That's not the right way to handle that. Uh, but Kyle Anderson, in a certain way, was asking for it a little bit with some of the comments that he reportedly uh, had said to Rudy Gobert. Definitely a, a tough situation and one that doesn't really look good for the franchise. Uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting game between these two. I, I do favor the Lakers here. Not only do they have home court advantage, but they've also had the Timberwolves number at certain times this year. I, I think if Minnesota was healthy, maybe a different discussion, but Jaden McDaniels actually broke his hand in the final game against the Pelicans as well by punching a wall uh, during halftime. So, you know, punches for Minnesota were not um, timely uh, this year, I would say, with the last game having two important punches maybe derail their season even more so than it already has been. Look, I was just flat out wrong about the Timberwolves this year. I thought this team was going to be a, a regular season wins machine. Now, I do think Cap missing some time definitely hurt the chances of that uh, as a regular season win team. But come playoff time, I, I wasn't super high on their chances anyway. I thought they'd be better the regular season. They haven't been, so this is me owning up to that a little bit. I also have a video on the channel talking about that. Uh, and why it hasn't gone to the level that I thought it could have. On the Lakers, they've been very impressive since Minnesota uh, made the D'Angelo Russell trade with them and Utah. Obviously, that kind of sprung the Lakers season forward and uh, kind of surprising uh, how well they've played. Now, I, I know that there's more roster balance there, but they did a lot of that without LeBron James healthy and in the lineup. I think the Lakers should be favored there at home, so I have them winning that game. And then you also look at the other side, 7-8. Uh, I think Miami has Atlanta's number. Uh, look back to last year in the playoffs, Miami, obviously a different team then, a little bit younger, a little bit fresher, I would say. Uh, this year they've had a down year, but I, I think they match up very well with Atlanta. Uh, and I think that last year they really showed that. I would be surprised if they don't go back to some of the same things they did last year that made Trey Young struggle in that series uh, quite a bit in the first round. So I don't like Atlanta's chances there. So because of that, I have the Lakers being the seventh seed in the West, and I have the Heat being the seventh seed in the East. Again, it's a single game, so anything can really happen, but those are my predictions for that. Then 10-9, we have the New Orleans Pelicans hosting the Oklahoma City Thunder, and I want to give a shout-out to the OKC Thunder. They've had such a great season, but I ultimately think that it ends at this spot because I think that the Pelicans match up very well with Oklahoma City, specifically OKC without Chet Holmgren. Uh, obviously, we'll see him next year. OKC, I think, is in a great spot moving forward. This little play-in appearance is awesome for them. Kind of instills some confidence in those young guys. Gives them some postseason-type experience as well in a winner-go-home type game. But I just don't really see an answer for Jonas Valanciunas uh, on the defensive end for Oklahoma City. We know how small this team is. We know they're not going to be a team that is going to be able to keep Jonas off the glass, which has been a, a huge tool for New Orleans down the stretch of this season. Now, Shea is one of the best offensive players in the world, so does he have a shot in a single game to get hot and you know get downhill and score at the rim with ease? Yeah, he does, especially against Jonas Valanciunas. So I think this is a very interesting dynamic matchup where the Thunder are going to have some ways to take advantage of the Pelicans' weaknesses, but I think the Pelicans have a little bit more length, size, rebounding to throw at Oklahoma City than OKC has You know, different avenues to match up with them. Now, I know they're going to play small, they're going to play quick, but ultimately, I do like New Orleans' odds here in this game. So I see New Orleans winning this 10-9 matchup. And then on the other side in the East, you know, the Bulls, they've been up and down this year. Vucevic uh, played all 82 games, so shout out to him for that. But uh, if you go back, I don't think the Bulls would uh, remake that Vucevic trade. And I think ultimately Toronto beats them here in this 10-9 game, specifically because I trust their defensive length a little bit more against Chicago. I think that they're going to be able to bother them, force a couple turnovers. Uh, now, I think it's going to be a highly competitive game, don't get me wrong, but this is just, you know, these are two teams here between Toronto and Chicago that I don't really trust in the playoffs that much, uh, just with the way that their rosters are currently built and uh, the teams that they currently have. Uh, so because of that, I, I see Chicago losing. Uh, now, I don't have a lot of belief in Toronto either. Jakob Pertl definitely has made them better, uh, but I don't think that they're a very good team. All year long, I've been kind of waiting for them to put it together, put it together, put it together, and they never have, never will in my eyes. Uh, so because of that, I'm not super high on Toronto either, but I think they have enough to beat Chicago, which leads us to our final games to grab the eight seed. And Minnesota will then at that point be hosting New Orleans based on my earlier predictions. And I think Minnesota wins that game. It's very, very tough. Of course, no McDaniels hurts, but the more I thought about it, having no Zion hurts even more uh, for New Orleans. I think that, you know, Brandon Ingram is an awesome player. Jonas is very good. 
but we saw pretty much everything fall apart for Minnesota in what was a must-win game in the eyes of New Orleans. I think for the seeding purposes, they wanted to win game 82, obviously. The Timberwolves did as well. Things got heated on the Timberwolves' side, but athletically, the Pelicans just did not have an answer for Anthony Edwards. And, you know, he got whatever he wanted, four steals, four blocks that game, a, a bevy of points, 14 rebounds as well. And my guess is Rudy Gobert won't punch a teammate in that game. Uh, and hopefully Kyle Anderson, the team will kind of, you know, maybe reunite, play together. Uh, now I'm kind of hoping by this point after a Lakers loss uh, that they'll figure some things out. It's possible, right? This is, again, one game elimination. Anything can happen. So I don't feel great about this, but uh, that's my honest prediction at this point. Then Toronto versus Atlanta. I like Atlanta here. Trey Young still, again, you give him two chances to make the playoffs through the play-in, and I like his odds quite a bit. So I do have the 7 and 8 in both conferences actually locking up those spots i know probably not the boldest prediction out there but again one game playoff i, I like the home court advantage and i like the teams that have just been better throughout the year uh last year i was a little bit more bold i uh, picked against uh the seven seed last year which happened to be minnesota and i ended up having to pay for that so uh i i don't ultimately think that uh you know I don't think that these are locks or anything, but that's how I feel currently, which leads us into our actual first series, which is the one seed Milwaukee Bucks taking on the now eight seed Atlanta Hawks, according to my predictions. And, you know, not to discredit the Hawks here, Trey Young is a dangerous player, but Drew Holiday is probably a top five, top three, maybe perimeter defender in the league. His screen navigation manipulation is very good. Uh, he's got some of the best hands in the NBA when it comes to using them to control where his offensive player is trying to drive. He does a very good job using his hips to cut off angles and uh, eliminate drive potential. And I think Trey Young, who is a very crafty ball handler, one of the better passers in the league as well, he's still going to find individual success. But I think the whole point here is Drew Holiday is going to make him work for that. And then I also think the Bucks are really going to target him on that end of the floor. One of the big key areas for Milwaukee this year the fact that Chris Middleton has missed as much time as he has and really not as big, had as big of a role uh, comes down to the fact that Drew Holiday has really filled in some of that absence and, and has been an awesome player for them so they're going to make Trey Young work they're going to bring him up to the level of the screen and make him guard uh, and I think by the end of a series Trey Young's going to be pretty tired and worn out and you know Giannis Antetokounmpo has that effect on everybody else he's facing as well uh, just with how much you know effort and team defense you need to have to uh, try and slow down a guy like him. This is also Quinn Snyder's first time coaching against Giannis in the postseason. So, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a benefit there as well where Budenholzer, you know, being an Eastern Conference coach, he's seen Trey Young quite a few times. Now, he hasn't seen DeJounte Murray as often, obviously, since this is DeJounte's first year in Atlanta. But I do think that most of the cards stack up very well for Milwaukee this postseason, especially in this 1-8 matchup. Which leads us to our 2-7 matchup, which is, I think, actually one of the tougher draws for Boston. A physical, switchable team like Miami, where Bam Adebayo can take you out of your screen and roll game with his switchability and his ability to move his feet laterally. I think this is a very tough matchup, actually, for Boston. Given the circumstances, right, you think, oh, well, 7 seed, that should be something to roll over. Miami's about the toughest 7 seed you can get. Last year, I picked the Boston Celtics to win against the Nets in five games. Most people in the comment section trolled me for that, saying, oh, you think the Nets aren't going to, you know, play way better than that? You don't think the Nets can push them further? Uh, and then they ended up sweeping the Nets. So don't get me wrong. I'm not disrespecting the Celtics here. The Celtics are an awesome team. I think they're going to win this series. I just wouldn't be shocked if it's not, you know, a sweep. I think this is probably something that's, Five games at minimum for sure. Six is where I really feel. Uh, and I wouldn't be completely shocked if it goes to seven because we've seen Jimmy Butler be the best player in a playoff series multiple times in his career. Now, would I bet on that against Jason Tatum this year? No, but I think that there's going to be some battling there. Uh, and I think there's going to be some argument over how Jimmy's playing compared to, J uh, to Jason. Now, the one big X factor, and he's not on the screen, which maybe I should have included him in the graphic, is Jalen Brown. Uh, he's such a good offensive player as well. And defensively, you know, at times he might be their worst defender on the floor and he's still a very good defender, which is really Boston's biggest strength is defensively when they're locked in, engaged and, and putting forth the effort that they need to. Their defensive rotations are so clean, so crisp, uh, and they're so switchable with good defenders all over the court uh, that they're going to be tough to beat. I, I just do like Boston in the series. Still, like I said, my prediction would be for them to win in six games. But I think Miami is a very, very tough draw. And the one thing about Boston is they are very three-point centric. So if there's a couple games where they're not hitting, that really does open the door for Miami. But when Boston is clicking on all cylinders, I don't think the Heat have enough to keep up with them. 
Then we go into our three six series which is another fun one the philadelphia 76ers will be hosting the brooklyn nets to start this series and this is one of my series that i'm probably most looking forward to for a few reasons this is philadelphia's chance to build some of that postseason chemistry which i think they really need going into a series uh in the second round against boston where you know i think boston's going to be favored in that series as i think they should because I just think Philadelphia doesn't match up very well with Boston, although MB definitely is something that Boston's going to struggle defending. I, I just think the length and the, the offensive capabilities that Boston has is going to present some issues for Philly. So it's very important that they take this series against Brooklyn serious. They try and get it over with quickly, give themselves some days to rest and to scout and evaluate and, and practice uh, some of the stuff that they want to employ against Boston a little bit later on. But Brooklyn's going to be a tough team to beat because they they have depth. This team can really defend. And I think the thing I'm really most excited to see is what does Mikhail Bridges do in the postseason as the number one guy? And specifically, what does he do on the defensive end? Do they put him on James Harden while still expecting him to be their number one scorer in the postseason? And also, what does Philly look to do against Spencer Dinwiddie? That's something else I'm looking to watch for. My early guess would be DeAnthony Melton takes that assignment. And I'm interested to see what happens with Tyrese Maxey's uh, playoff minutes this year. And if Doc Rivers leans more and more into Melton as a defensive guy around Embiid and Harden, or if they go with the you know three guard lineup that we've seen a bit this year too with Maxi Embiid, or excuse me, Maxi Harden and uh, also Melton as well. I'll be surprised to see a lot of Shake Milton this postseason, but you never really know, right? Something could happen, and Doc Rivers has had some bad playoff moments as a coach, so you never really know. But I'm very interested in seeing what Mikhail Bridges does defensively. And the Nets, they do have a lot of players who they can throw at James Harden, whether that's Dorian Finney-Smith, who I'd expect to see on him quite a bit. And I also want to see how Brooklyn tries to defend Joel Embiid if they just flat out put Nick Claxton on him, which I don't think that they should do. If anything, I think they should put Dorian Finney-Smith on Joel Embiid and have Nick Claxton play massive, massive help uh, and, and almost try and zone him out a little bit with early planned rotations to the corner. You can't let P.J. Tucker get you know six to nine points a game on easy open looks because P.J. Tucker offensively doesn't offer anything other than those corner three-point attempts, uh, to be honest with you. So I think that they need to find ways to eliminate Philadelphia's number one options to win this series. Now, again, I'm going to pick Philadelphia here in five games. I think Philadelphia is significantly better than Brooklyn. Obviously, Brooklyn's got some tough situations uh, in terms of the Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving saga, That how that played out. You know, this isn't the team that Brooklyn really wants to have. This is kind of a conglomeration of pieces that they're going to ultimately shuffle around a little bit in the future. But it's still impressive that Brooklyn has found what they found in Mikhail Bridges, a player I've really liked for a long time. But it's awesome to see him really flourish offensively. Uh, and I like this team overall. Four, Cleveland Cavaliers versus the New York Knicks. And this one's really, really fun for me because Donovan Mitchell, you know, so many rumors last year about him going to the Knicks. Last year I made a video after the Knicks attended that Jazz Mavs game and said, trust me guys, they're there for Jalen Brunson, not for Donovan Mitchell. And ultimately that's how things have shuck out since then because Jalen Brunson's playing for the Knicks. Donovan Mitchell has been playing for the Cavs and both of these teams have been very, very good. The Cavs are top three in net rating this season. They pretty much have been the top of that all year long specifically with their defensive prowess their defensive rating is very 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 good and of course it's headlined by Evan Mobley and Jared Allen who I think are going to be hugely pivotal in this series against uh, Julius Randle I think Allen and Mobley are going to have really high impact games this postseason specifically against New York which is why I favor Cleveland here but this is a seven game series in my eyes specifically because of Jalen Brunson's ability to be crafty and creative around the rim. He uses his pivot foot better than pretty much 95, 98% of NBA players. Of course, he's a little undersized, which is why he's so reliant on that pivot foot. He's not the most athletic guy in the world, but he's strong. He's smart. He seemingly never turns the basketball over either. So because of that, New York, in a slowdown game, they have a shot if Cleveland's not hitting from the perimeter. And if Donovan Mitchell has a couple games where he struggles to get it going. I think that opens the door for New York, but ultimately we've seen, you know, Mitchell be the guy in playoff series before he's advanced in the playoffs multiple times in his career, mostly obviously in Utah, but now in Cleveland, I think he has a shot to show that again. And it's going to be a, a series that I think gets a lot of coverage nationally because if Donovan Mitchell single-handedly knocks out the Knicks with some incredible postseason shooting, some incredible postseason performances, people are going to go back to the discussions 
uh, in the trades between the Knicks and the uh, Jazz, where the Knicks ultimately decided to not reach the Jazz's asking point uh, for Donovan Mitchell. And if he sends them home this season, there's going to be a lot of questions about management there. Even though the Knicks have had a very good season, I think they've made some very smart moves. Uh, the Josh Hart trade was very good for them, obviously. Uh, the, the Knicks team is very good, and they're in a really good position long term. I'm just saying that people around the, the world and, and specifically ESPN is going to be questioning the Knicks again, even if it's fair or not. But I do like the Cavs here in seven games. I think a very tight competitive series, which leads us now into the Western Conference. And I do want to talk for a second here before I get into this Nuggets Timberwolves series. Uh, so everyone listen really closely because this is, you know, the spot of the video where I, I think anything can happen in the West. I, and I mean anything like the teams. I do not think there's that big of a gap between one and 10, to be honest. And even one to 11, I know the Mavs season ended so terribly that, you know, that might sound ridiculous, but in playoff basketball, sometimes you can exploit some team's weaknesses. And I think all of these teams have certain weaknesses. And I think a lot of them have a lot of strong points as well. You know, I think the West has been mainly hated on by national media this year. I don't think that's quite fair because I think that the West is actually pretty strong. There's a lot of really good, talented players and, and talented teams. I think that they all just keep beating up on each other. And that's why no teams really pulled that far ahead other than Denver and, you know, Memphis to a certain extent. Uh, but to be honest, I think anything can happen. So just bear with me throughout this. I know you guys are going to disagree with some of the takes I have in here. That is completely fine. Trust me, I think these are going to be very good competitive series, including this first one here where I have the Minnesota Timberwolves being my eighth seed through the play in tournament. Again, anything can happen in that setting. But the Denver Nuggets, I don't think they just walk in and roll over Minnesota here. Now, do I think Minnesota is going to win this series? Definitely not. I think that Denver will probably in five or six games. But I'm, I'm saying some of these games down the stretch are going to be competitive and close for a few different reasons. One, Carl Anthony Towns shooting ability will stretch out the floor a little bit against Denver, which I'm interested to see who they put on him. Will Jokic guard him? Will Aaron Gordon guard him? And if Aaron Gordon's on him, then you're taking one of your more athletic players out to the perimeter which opens up the lane for some potential driving avenues for a guy like Anthony Edwards which we know Nikola Jokic does not really defend the basket very well in fact he ranks bottom four among all NBA centers in rim protection in terms of deterrence and also actually stopping a shot at the rim and, and forcing a miss he does not do either of those things very well now he's a very good defensive rebounder which will help Denver in this series but he's not a good rim protector that's you know it's not a surprise to anybody that i'm saying this with rudy gobert around there too my question is do they put him on gobert but does that make him very liable to be a pick and roll target where they try and clear out the floor and have guys attack Jokic downhill is he going to play and drop coverage that's what i would recommend doing against minnesota but at the same time i think that that could be a little challenging for denver because well one you're giving kind of a head start to anthony edwards maybe mike conley who's a very good facilitator and obviously has that right hand floater down pat so I think this is a tough series, actually, for Denver, even though the seeding would suggest it's not. But I do think that they get the job done probably in five or six games. But I think Minnesota is a little sneakier here than most people would expect because I do have some questions about Denver's rim protection. I think Minnesota matches up decently well into that, actually, with Ant, Gobert, Cat. I think it's an interesting matchup. Secondly, Memphis Grizzlies here playing my pres my presumed seven seed, the Los Angeles Lakers. And to be honest, I think this is one of the worst matchups the Lakers could have gotten in this postseason because one of the advantages the LA Lakers usually have around people is the ability to bully inside and the ability to run in transition. Well, now they're playing one of the faster teams in the NBA in Memphis. And this is going to be a little bit more of a track series than we're typically used to seeing in the playoffs where the game slows down. Both of these teams like going fast, and I think that still benefits Memphis, even though the Lakers have a vast number of points in transition this year. LeBron James leads all NBA players in transition baskets this season uh, per game, that is. So uh, I think that, you know, LeBron, the Lakers, they want to play fast and they want to play inside, but I think the Grizzlies do too. And I think the Grizzlies are a little bit deeper inside. I think that Jaron Jackson Jr.'s impact. Now, if he stays out of foul trouble, that's the big question. But I think he could have a nice series here, limiting Anthony Davis around the rim. And my big question is, what is Anthony Davis's real aggression look like in this series? Is he going to settle for 18 to 23-foot jump shots and three-pointers? Because if he is, then Memphis is winning this series in five games. If he's trying to get to the rim and he's trying to score 40 and average 15 rebounds 
a game at the rim, around the rim, in the paint, then this is where things could get a little hairy for Memphis, who is going to miss Steven Adams in this game. He'd be another nice body to throw at Anthony Davis. So does Jaron Jackson get in foul trouble because Anthony Davis is attacking downhill and being an awesome rim runner off of screens, which is really when I think Anthony Davis is off his best, or at his best, excuse me, when he's playing without the ball in his hands. He's being more of a traditional big man, playing without it in his hands, and then catching on lobs, on rolls, getting the ball eight to 10 feet away from the hoop and then using some of his touch and offensive skill set from that point. That's when I think he's at his best. And I think that could put some pressure on Memphis, especially if Triple J is getting into foul trouble. But I do think Desmond Bain eats in this series. I think the Lakers are still probably a man short and a dollar shy when it comes to matching up with Memphis here. I think Canari could have a nice role in this series as well, keeping Memphis uh, competitive when Jaws off the floor offensively. So I think that there's some real nice counterpoints between these two teams. I think that Anthony Davis, again, if he plays the way he's capable of, the Lakers can push this series to maybe seven. But I'm just not confident in that. For that reason, I'm going to pick Memphis in six. But the Lakers have been very good. And this is really not a disappointing end to their season. Based on where they were two and a half months ago, the Lakers just flat out being a playoff team is a huge win for that organization, uh, which has gone from counting banners to counting uh, their playoff seating and, and how many playing games they have to play in the postseason. Our next matchup here is another fun one, and I almost feel bad for Kings fans a little bit. Um, Kings fans, first of all, let, let's talk. So I just kind of gave the Lakers a little bit of hype for where they finished. Look, you guys are the three seed. There is no reason to hate on the season, regardless of how it ends in the playoffs, whether that's round one, losing in the finals, whatever it may be. There's no reason to feel bad about how the season ends for Sacramento because one, the drought is broken. Second, the beam has been lit so many times this year. And third, this team's been a lot of fun. Uh, De'Aaron Fox has literally been like prime Michael Jordan in the fourth quarter this year. Demonis Sabonis should be an all-NBA player this season. I would think third team. Uh, I also think De'Aaron Fox should be a lock to be a top two all-NBA team selection as well this year. So it's been a great year, but this is the one team they really did not want to draw in the playoffs. And, uh, and the reason why... The trio on the left, the reason I chose an old picture, an old graphic uh, for them here is because they were winning titles before De'Aaron Fox was in the league. And they won one last year. And the Kings, it's their first time being in the playoffs in 16 years. And that does matter a little bit. Now, does it define the series and does it make it a sweep? No, it does not. But while the lights are bright, the Kings are going to be there for the first time. Demonis Sabonis has not played very many playoff games in his career. De'Aaron Fox has never played a playoff game in his career. Kevin Herter, he's probably the most experienced playoff player, other than Harrison Barnes, of course, who found success with Golden State. But Keegan Murray's a rookie. Malik Monk's not really played in the playoffs. There's going to be a lot of guys in Sacramento wearing that nice purple color, unsure of what the playoffs are like, whereas the team on the other side is going to have won four finals in the last eight years. That is a significant advantage. I picked the Warriors here in six games. Now, I know that they've struggled to win on the road this year. I think the uh, final game where they put up 151 or 157 points, excuse me, on the road against a Portland Tank Blazers team where they're trying to lose, I know that shouldn't mean a lot, but they're trying to send a message. Uh, they locked themselves into the sixth seed. Uh, and I think they feel very good about their chances still. They have one of the best five-man lineups in the NBA. And when they're healthy, when they're clicking, they're a team I would not have wanted to play. Right now, if I had to pick a favorite, if I, you know, if I was held at gunpoint and you, I had to pick somebody to represent me uh, in the West, I would choose Golden State. Now, I know that might sound really stupid. It's possible to get bounced in the first round. Like, I don't feel great about this Warriors team. I just feel slightly better about them than I do others. And I think this is a very tough matchup for Sacramento, specifically when Draymond is the small ball center. But I do think Kevon Looney is still going to find success as a screener in this series. I think that the Warriors are going to make Demonis Sabonis uh, defend out in space. And I think, uh, you know, the Kings aren't going to slow down their game. The The Warriors will. And it's going to come down to execution. If the Kings are hitting shots, they could definitely knock this team out. But I just like the experience over the youth. Um, I, you know, I don't want to be the, a, a, the, the rain on the parade, uh, so to speak. But I just don't really like Sacramento's chances in this series. Again, I think this is probably the worst team that they could have drawn uh, when it comes to that 3-6 series. And now I saved the best for last. The probably most entertaining series in the postseason in round one. This is an incredible first round matchup between the Phoenix Suns, who are the four seed. So the game will start in Arizona 
and then slowly that trend uh that series will transition over to los angeles where the clippers uh, would then later on be hosting the phoenix suns and for this matchup the four five it's such a dynamic series because there's so many things that could go wrong for both teams or for one team and you never really know this is probably the toughest series to pick and to be honest i haven't picked a winner yet at the time i'm recording this i told myself after going back and forth flip-flopping while recording or while planning this video out i said you know i'm gonna hit record and whatever comes out is what comes out because that's how close i think this series is i think it's gonna go seven games regardless now let's talk about the pros for each team and maybe i'll talk myself into one of them the clippers What's the pros for them? Well, this is the only team really in the in the league that has less playtime together than the LA Clippers. So that's a huge positive for them. The Phoenix Suns have played like nine games with Kevin Durant. Now I know they've won out pretty much all nine of them. They've been great, uh, but they've played some teams that haven't been healthy. The Suns don't have a, a big track record playing with Durant. And this is also a very injury prone team over in Phoenix, just like the Clippers themselves are. Chris Paul has been known to miss playoff time in his career. Devin Booker has been dealing with more injuries. Now, do I think that's going to make him miss a lot of playoff time? No, but remember last year against the Pelicans, we saw him miss a, a few games in the first round. Kevin Durant is infamous for injuries at this point. Not that it makes him a worse player, but it just might mean he might not be available for a game or two, which is a huge added benefit to the Clippers as well. But now let's go to the Phoenix Suns side. Paul George, he's already dealing with an injury. He was in a knee brace, was using crutches earlier in the week. It's possible that he doesn't play at all in this series. I do not know the status on Paul George at the time I'm recording this. Now, the fact that there's a couple off days in here, I do think benefits the LA Clippers a little bit more than the Suns because they have the chance to get healthy, whereas the Suns are currently healthy, but the Suns do have some practice time here. So it benefits both sides. I think it slightly benefits the Clippers more. But the other thing about the, uh, the Suns here is if you're worried about experience, well, this is the team you'd want to play, right? So kind of the same points go back and forth here between these two teams because the Clippers have not played that much together, specifically with Russell Westbrook. Now, I do think the fact that Ross and Kevin Durant are facing off here is going to be a very fun first round series uh, filled with a lot of drama. The former Thunder buddies over in Oklahoma City now find themselves dueling against each other in the Western Conference uh, playoffs, something I don't think at the beginning of the year we would have thought would be happening. Uh, but here it is, the NBA, you know, anything can happen at any moment. Uh, and Russell Westbrook versus Kevin Durant is a first round series, which is going to be very entertaining. Uh, and by the way, Kawhi Leonard and Kevin Durant are the only two guys in the NBA this year to average 20 plus points a game, shooting over 50% from the field and 40% from three. Kawhi Leonard's back to being Kawhi. Kevin Durant has always been Kevin Durant. And if these two guys are healthy, it's going to be a bloodbath series. Now the Clippers have a huge advantage when it comes to depth. And the Phoenix Suns at some point are going to have to play guys who either cannot shoot, cannot defend, cannot rebound, or just simply aren't good players. Uh, whether that's a combination of those things, there, there's going to be some issues with Phoenix. Now they might have two of the three best players in the series. I, to be honest, I would think the, the best player on any given night could be Kawhi. It could be Kevin Durant. That's how good those two guys are. And then I think, you know, there's chances that Devin Booker in some of these nights could definitely steal the spotlight as well because he's that talented of an offensive player. So you think, oh, well, they, if they have two of the three best players, they might have the advantage, but the Clippers are going to consistently have the seventh, eighth, ninth best player in the series pretty much every single night. Now, does that mean it's Norm Powell one night, Rob Covington another night? Probably. There's going to be nights where you don't really know what you're getting from some of your depth if you're the Clippers, but you have enough depth that you're going to get something. Whereas the Suns, if you have to rely on Josh Okogie for a playoff game, I, I just don't know if I trust that. Now, Okogie, he's had a pretty nice year for them in his role, but he's not going to be a reliable three-point shooter. He's not going to be somebody I would trust with open shots. Now, uh, the Clippers are going to give him a variety of open shots, and there's going to be nights where he's hitting them, and the Suns are going to be unbeatable those nights. But if he's missing... It's a huge weakness for Phoenix. And, and same thing with Torrey Craig. Same thing with TJ Warren, who's probably their best depth piece. Uh, you know, Landry Shamit, you think, okay, well, his shooting's huge, but the Clippers are going to attack him. They know him very, very well from his time in LA, and they're going to look to bring him up in the pick and roll. And Kawhi Leonard's going to probably post him up a little bit, uh, take him downhill as a, a driver. And, and Kawhi Leonard's still one of the strongest players in the NBA. So I think there's going to be things on both sides that I just... I don't like if I if I know Phoenix's fifth player shooting the ball well that night and he's defending decently, which I prefer a Kogi or Warren or Craig to be those guys, 
then I think that they win the series. But I just don't know that. And because of that, I know this is going to be controversial. I'm picking the LA Clippers in seven games. Uh, you know, this is a Western Conference Finals rematch in a way from what we saw a couple of years ago. Now you add in Kevin Durant, you add in Russell Westbrook. I think the Clippers just have more ways that they can play. They can pivot to five out small ball if they want to. They haven't done that at all since getting Mason Plumlee, but it's still in Tyloo's back pocket. They've got more front court depth. They've got way more back court depth. And I think because of that, the Suns, they're so, so hamstringed by one injury that I do prefer the Clippers here in this series. I know that, you know, the Suns are healthy going into it, but if they end up the series, you know, finishing the series not healthy, it's a it's a huge red flag for me. I picked the Clippers in seven games, but I think this is the best, the closest series and the most entertaining to watch in the first round, which leads me to my overall favorites. The West, like I said, who really knows? I, it, I think it's very open. A lot of people are going to say the Nuggets. There's not really a great argument as to why they're not. Uh, other than just not being sure if I trust Jokic defensively in the postseason with the way that the game is played, how aggressive teams are at targeting a single player specifically when that's a center who does not protect the rim. I don't love that for them. I think by default, I would prefer Golden State. I think the Clippers or Suns can make noise, though. Uh, those would be my three preferences in the Western Conference, although I don't like the Clippers' chances against Denver because Denver has historically owned the Clippers. So I think it really becomes a matchup game uh, depending on what happens from there. And then the East, you see the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, I think are my clear favorite in the East. Um, I, I think that Middleton goes a long way. I'm um, in helping them against Boston, like where last year we saw Boston just barely topple Milwaukee. I think Drew's taking a step forward. I think the Bucks have gotten better. The addition of Joe Ingles and Jay Crowder will really, really help Milwaukee against a matchup with Boston. Brooke Lopez has been playing some of the best basketball of his career. I, I just like them uh, in the East, and that you know, since they're my only clear favorite at this point, they have to be my favorite to win the title as well. It's funny, a month ago or so, I recorded a video on who my favorite was to win the NBA title, and back then I said Boston. So I, I do think it's going to be competitive between Boston and Milwaukee. I think the West is wide open and going to be very competitive. This is going to be some of the best playoff basketball we've ever seen. So I'm very excited for that. I hope you are as well. Thank you everyone so much for watching. I really hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content. Remember, there's a lot of great content coming out on the channel pretty much every single day here now. So make sure to stay tuned for that. And we'll catch you guys in the very next utility sports video.